of the Lord. Are y'all going to help me preach again today? Come on, come on. Big things coming from small places. You know, as I think about the Christmas message, and I am, um, I'm, I'm going to be honest, and I say this very frequently, as you, if you go on Facebook, go on social media, you're going to see a lot of people talking about this Christmas holiday season. Some of them will be celebrating the holiday, and others will be speaking of the fact that Jesus was not born at this time of the year. <laughs> they will argue that up and down, and quite frankly, it's true. He was very likely not born in December. And so, you know, at first I started to kind of get worked up about that myself, but then I thought about something, ladies and gentlemen. I thought about the fact that the Bible chooses not just in one gospel, but in multiple gospels to tell the story of the fact that he was indeed born. Yeah. So if the Bible takes that much time, effort, and energy to put the story out there about our Savior being born, whether we celebrate it in December or whether we celebrate it in September, whether we celebrate it in March or April, wherever you want to celebrate it, it does not change the fact that Jesus was born. And obviously the Bible gives some credence to celebrating it in the fact that it told the story multiple times. Uh-huh. Come on. Now, I will be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen, what I have a struggle with, personally, this is just wrong, y'all can do what you want to do, but my struggle is some of the symbols and the signs that have taken root in the culture of Christianity as it relates to Christmas. Uh -huh. I'm not talking to me up here, I'm getting ready to kick over some cows, but I don't care. Hmm. The reality is we have made big celebrations around our trees. Mm -hmm. Come on, come on. You better not tell me you're not putting up a tree in the house or it's going to be a problem mm. for most folks. Now, we celebrate and we talk about holly and the reeds, but most people don't understand that a lot of that stuff actually came from pagan background. Uh-huh. Come on, come on. Lord have mercy, it's tight, but it's right. Work. And, and so people get off, and if you really pay attention to most of the songs that we call Christmas songs, we're talking about a fat man in a red suit. Mm. Yeah. We're talking about, now watch this, a lot of the songs that we call Christmas songs aren't really Christmas songs, they're winter songs. <laughs> Why y'all not talking to me up in here? Come on, come on. A lot of the songs that we call Christmas songs are really winter songs. Let me prove my point. Sleigh bells ring, are you listening? In the lane, snow is listening. Sing the love song as we go along, walking in a... Or we'll sing things like jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Oh, what fun it is to ride. On the open sleigh. Don't sound like Christmas to me. Sounds like a winter song. Help us. I'm going to work for you today. Work. We sing all of these winter songs and call them Christmas songs because that's when they play them around, around Christmas time. Uh huh. And then we got songs like Up Through the House Stop. Y'all know that song. I'm talking about St. Nick. St. <laughs> Nick. Got a fat man coming down your chimney. Wow. Oh, I got the fat man coming down the chimney. Have some cookies. <laughs> now, I used to ask the question. First, I used to ask the question because I used to live when I was growing up. When I first was you know, young, real young, growing up, we lived in an apartment. Come on, man. Come on, come on. How is Santa going to get to me if I live in an apartment and he got to come down the chimney? Uh huh. My God. So it did. Now listen, parents, if y'all still tell if y'all still telling your children that lie, y'all might want to cover their ears right now. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm gonna be honest, Elder Larry. I'm gonna be honest. 
I got a problem here. Can I, can I, can I talk to you for a minute? <laughs> Here's my problem. If I work hard all year long, making money, trying to look out for my family, how in the world and why in the world am I going to get credit to some fat man from the North Pole for putting his up on the tree? I'm sorry, that's just me, y'all. That's just me. You talk, Michael, you talk about you saw Mama kissing Santa Claus. I need to know who that was. In this case, he sure is. <laughs> but we have told those lies. And we've made Christmas about holly and wreaths. Now, can I get one more off my chest, y'all? Can I just get one more, get one more off my chest? If it's your birthday party, now see, I've had a problem sometimes with the, you know, we, we, go crazy over making sure we buy folk gifts and things like that and we gotta give to this one and give to that one and help this one help. I got one problem. If you come to my birthday party, why are you giving everybody else a gift but me? Man, you can throw them out. Elder, why won't they talk to me this morning? They got talking, they got real quiet. They were shouting earlier. They're quiet on me now. Mm. But it's supposed to be my birthday celebration. And we say it's a symbol. We do it as a sign of God having given a gift. I would rather go and be a blessing to somebody and help one so give Jesus what he wants. Y'all not talking up in here. Why won't we give Jesus what he wants for his birthday celebration rather than trying to figure out who, how to buy the next iPad, how to buy the next Xbox, how to, oh, y'all not talking up in here, how to buy the next pair of secrets. Listen, I'll bless you real good for your birthday, but when it's his, I'm going to honor him. Yeah. Come on. I mean, that's just me. Now, y'all, like I said, y'all do what you want to do. Maybe you stop going broke and you start figuring out what Christmas is really supposed to be about. Okay, wait, I thought I had one more. I got one more. Can I get one more out? One more. I promise. I, I, I'm not, I didn't leave. I didn't, I didn't leave Bethlehem. I didn't. I promise you. But now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't understand how it is that folk who won't do anything for the homeless or anybody else for the rest of the year, all of a sudden, we get all Googly eyed about giving and being a blessing and being kind to folk. It's just the season to be giving. No, the season to be giving is all year long. You mean to tell me they're not hungry throughout the rest of the year? You think that one meal you put together for them at Christmas time is going to carry them through the, the rest of the year? You want to give Jesus a present? Be a blessing through the whole year. Think about the needs of the homeless through the whole year. Think about social injustice through the whole year. Be a blessing through the whole year, not just at Christmas. Now, as I take this time, <laughs> I've made everybody mad with me now. <laughs> One thing I have come to discover about my life and as I look at the lives of believers who have tapped into the things of God, we say it, but I don't know that we really believe it, but the steps of a good man mm -mm. are ordered by the Lord. And that really speaks of, now pay attention right here, because that really speaks of the providence of God. Mm. Somebody say providence. Providence. What that word literally means is that God is in control. Oh Lord, somebody should have got happy right there because it's the fact that God is in control. I know things may look a little crazy in your life, but God is in control. Yes. Woo! I just felt something right there. Ladies and gentlemen, one thing I can appreciate about God is God knows how to work 
everything that happens in our lives together for our good. Y'all will see where I'm going in just a minute. But God knows how to set everything up in your life to work together for your good. Come on. And the thing I shout about, Bishop, is that at the end of the thing, something good is going to come out of all of it. Yes. So while you're in the middle of the hell of your life, you ought to start to Confessing, something good is about to come out of this. I may not like it right now, but something good is coming out of this. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, God. God gives us a preview of this place called, what's going to happen in this place called Bethlehem, all the way back in the book of Genesis. Can I preach like I feel it today? Preach. In the book of Genesis, you have a man who has married a woman by the name of Rachel. You know, Jacob married Rachel, and he married Leah. And Rachel, he has two babies by, one of them by the name of Joseph, one of them by the name of Benjamin. Now, you have to understand, ladies and gentlemen, when you start talking about uh, Rachel, Rachel was giving birth to Benjamin when she died. Come on, come on. On her way out of here, when she was about to die, she named that last son Benoni. Mm -hmm. Somebody say Benoni. Benoni. Benoni means the son of my sorrow. Uh, if you're not careful, sometimes in your life, you can start naming things what you see rather than what they really are. You can start calling things what they look like right now rather than what God has ordained for them to be. And so the Bible declares she named him Benoni, but then Jacob turned around and said, no, his name can't be Benoni. His name has to be Benjamin. Benoni means the son of my trouble, but Benjamin means the son of my right hand. He pronounced prophetically over his situation even when the situation looked bad. And I come to tell somebody in here, there will be days in your life when you will take losses, but if you take your losses, God's going to give you great pain. Yes! Warming up. He lost his wife while she was giving birth to their last son. But ladies and gentlemen, Right after that, when he went to bury Rachel, he buried her in the place close to, right there near Bethlehem. Come on. Lord have mercy. He buried her right near Bethlehem. Now the thing that makes me shout about that is it's a sign, even in the midst of losses, God is setting something up. You got to come to a conclusion that in the middle of all of this, God is setting something up. We go a little further in the Bible, and there were there was a lady by the name of Naomi. Lord, I feel like preaching. Oh, Jesus, oh, God. God. Yeah. Her and her husband, they left Bethlehem. Now let me clarify something for you, ladies and gentlemen. The place of Bethlehem, the name itself, means the house of bread. Lord have mercy. But the reason why Naomi and her husband left the place of bread or the house of bread was because in Bethlehem, where there was supposed to be bread, there was no bread. Sounds to me like a lot of churches these days. In the house of bread, there is no... Okay, I'm going to leave that alone. But what about you, ladies and gentlemen, where you're supposed to be productive and fruitful, and in the moments where things are really going to be flowing in your life, there should be bread, but there is no... So they leave there. I'm going to take my time to work this today. They leave there and they go to a place called Moab. And when they get there, they find two, da two daughters of Moab to marry their sons. And the Bible declares that the husband died. The Bible declares that the two sons died. And there were two girls left without husbands. And they 
Naomi said, what am I supposed to do? I can't give you any more children right now. What are your kids? Go back to your parents' house. Go back to the Moabite ways. Go back to the way you used to live. And when I'm going to go back to where I came from. You go where you got to go. And there's a girl called Orpah. Orpah said, no, I'm going to go ahead on back. See you later. Bye-bye. But then there was a girl by the name of Ruth. She said she had found favor with Naomi. And something about her. She said, I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to stay connected. God have mercy. Something to be said about the power of your connection. <laughs> In this season, somebody ought to recognize when God is sending divine connection. Sometimes God is sending you in places and putting you in uncomfortable positions because he needs you to connect with somebody. Either you're going to be a blessing to them or they're going to be a blessing to you. Wow, God have mercy. God is setting you up. So, Ruth says, I ain't going nowhere. Some of y'all, they say, why do y'all go to that church over there? Y'all ain't got about 20 members, 25 at best. Why do you keep going over there? Because there's something about my connection. Because there's something about my connection. I can't even explain it to you. Don't ask me to try. But the fact that I'm here while I'm here, there's something about my connection. I'm not just here because Mr. Wright is here. I'm not just here because first thing is here. I'm here because it's a divine connection. There's something that God wants to work out in me while he's got me here. There's something God wants to do in me that he couldn't do anywhere else. He brought me here to make it happen.
You can go shit and come on those that they have. We've been so accustomed to having to go and work on it and make it happen for ourselves. God says, I'm not going to put it in a position where you got to make it happen for yourself. He said, what I'm about to do in your life is I'm about to bring the blessing right there to your house. And then you're not going to be able to do anything else until the order gets released on your life, until you are pronounced into your next season, until you are pronounced into the prophetic future that has been designated for your life. It's coming to you. My God. My God. Key. You don't have to work on it. You just got to work at it. Let me clarify what I'm saying. David did not go working to be king. Mm. <laughs> David was working to take care of his father's sheep because he was faithful at what his assignment was. God chose to raise him up because he was diligent at his assignment. Just like y'all know I don't do a lot of touch your neighbors, but tell somebody around you that you can't afford to go trying to make it happen for yourself. Uh uh, don't try to make it happen for yourself. You can't afford to do that. You gotta just do what God calls you to do. And while you're doing what He calls you to do, in that time, God's gonna raise you up and Send forth the oil that will be the prophetic destiny of your life. Is this helping somebody today? I think about Joseph. Everybody talks about Joseph. But Joseph wasn't looking for anything. He wasn't, when, even when he had a dream, he wasn't looking for anything. Joseph was just being who he was, and God gave him a dream because God had appointed him for something. Let me keep that home. David was born there. David was born there. He was anointed there. Y'all get ready because in the very place where they ostracized you. Elder Larry, in the very place where they look back at your past and say, I remember when. And they say, I don't think he can and I don't think he will be. In the very place, that's going to be the place where God sends the prophetic oil to fall on you, and before long they're going to look up and wonder how you got to where you are. They don't understand what God was doing behind the scenes. All they see is when they watch this, when the oil showed up, it couldn't show up for any of the rest of them. But when it got on, when it came and showed up on the scene, that oil popped open and started flowing freely. I don't know who I'm talking to in here, but there's somebody in this room that the oil is about to start flowing freely. In your life. Now, one step further. <laughs> now, there came a day when David was running from Saul and he was in a stronghold. Yeah. Doesn't matter how anointed you are, there will come times when you will find yourself isolated. No, been there. there will come a time you're going to find yourself isolated. There will come times when you find, I don't care if you've got the oil on you. See, that's the mistake that a lot of the church makes now because they think because they're anointed that they're exempt from problems, they're exempt from struggle, they're exempt from isolation, they're exempt from people walking away from them, they're exempt, oh God, they're exempt from losing friends, they're exempt from their family walking away. People seem to think for some reason, because you got oil, you are exempt. Let me, let me drop an insertion here. The night that I got engaged, I was going through so much in my mind. People were coming up and they were hugging us and celebrating us and saying how happy they were for us. But in my mind, I could not even enjoy the moment because I was saying to myself, I, I'm so, watch this, I've been so used to pain. None of y'all. None of you. I'm talking to you. I was so used to being hurt so used to fake church folk. I was just standing there wondering where was the dagger going to come. No, not talking. 
I was standing there wondering who was going to stab me in the back. Where was the attack going to come from? I said, Lord, no, just as sure as this is happening, and this is good news, sure. Can I be transparent? Most of y'all know my story. Most of y'all know my background. So you would think when God starts doing something special for me, come on, come and on. has completely flipped the script, you would think that church folk would be happy for what God is doing in my life. Rather than church folk being happy, a whole lot of them had a whole lot to say. But guess what? I don't care what you got to say. Talk, Elder. It took Elder McCall Caldwell to come in here and preach that Sunday morning and talk about the oil and the wine to wake me up to what God was really doing in my life. He showed me through the word of God that I was wounded real deep because I had been wounded so bad. I was laying there half dead, but it showed me that I was looking at the wrong path. I'm still alive. Everybody else can cut me out, but I'm still alive. Preach. Somebody, oh Lord, I don't know who I'm talking to, but somebody out the holler, I'm still alive. I'm still alive. I, they can't see it, but I'm still alive. They call me dead, but I'm still alive. Not only am I still alive, but I'm on the mend because God is sending somebody to pour in the oil and the wine. I'm not going to keep being who I was because God is healing all the broken places of my life. God is restoring every damaged place of my life. And he's pouring in the oil that makes sure that it does not get infected again. I come to tell somebody that God is ministering healing to your life today on this day before Christmas. Healing is here. Hallelujah. I'm sorry, though. I feel like preaching this morning. And so, and so, everybody else kind of gave it up. That's all right. Because God had a plan. It was a setup. <laughs> David's in a cave. Uh -huh, uh -huh. He's in a cave isolated. Uh -huh. Running from Saul. The Philistines, watch this, ladies and gentlemen. The Philistines had gone in and set up a garrison in his home. In his hometown, they had set up, they had put a military outpost in his home. And David start, he thought to himself, and he said to his mighty men that were surrounding him, he said, y'all, if only I could have a cool, sweet drink of water from the wells of Bethlehem. The place that seems so obscure, if only I could have some water from that place. I'll be all right. Sometimes you just need a good reflection moment because in your reflection is coming some refreshing. Preach long, I feel like preaching. Y'all better help me here because I'm coming up the hill. And so now the fruit that his mighty men went down there and they broke through. Come on, come on. That's why you got to be careful who you're connected to in this hour. You got to make sure you're connected to strong people who are connected to your vision and who have your best interest in mind. Y'all didn't call that to me. Make sure you got people who have your best interest in mind. Why do you need people who have your best interest in mind? Because when you don't have the strength to fight, they'll stand up and fight for you. When you feel like throwing in the towel, they'll stand up and say, I got your back. When you feel like it's over, they'll tell you it's not over. Oh, God, I'm talking to somebody in here. You need people in your life that will fight for you and with you. My God. And so the Bible said, Elder, that they went and they broke through the garrisons of the Philistines and they got that water and they brought it back to the man of God. You need people who can refresh your life, not zap the life out of you. Some folk are zapping the life out of you. And it's time for you to start making some changes in your life and connect to people who know how to fight with you and so now I'm prepared to turn this corner and close this message. Y'all, I come to tell you 
Bethlehem is mentioned again in Micah chapter 5. And it says, Bethlehem Ephrathah. Uh, 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 uh. The Bible is very deliberate when it uses words. Amen. It does not waste words, Grady. The Bible doesn't waste words, Sister Hannah. Kiesha doesn't waste words. And it says, Bethlehem Ephrathah. I told you that Bethlehem means the house of bread. But Ephrathah means the fruitful place. Y'all should have shouted real good if you came to understand that even though your life may seem small right now, what God has prophetically announced over you and pronounced over you, he's pronounced you fruitful. Everybody else is going under, and yet you're not going under. You are. He just have mercy. You're in a fruitful place. God, it was no. Everything was known for the corn that was used to make bread. It was known for figs. It was known for the vine. It was known for fruitfulness. You ought to get happy today because what God has said about you, He has declared you fruitful. Somebody say it's my time. Coming out of the small places. I know I've been through a lot. 
getting ready for the icing on the cake. I wish I had about five people that would start celebrating that the icing is coming. The icing is coming. I can't. Don't give him a cute praise. Praise him the way you expect your icing to come. Yeah. 